Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you for uh, being out here tonight. Uh, that was a, a very lovely song and uh, uh, sung very beautifully. Thank you for that. And uh, thank you for um, uh, all of you who uh, are here to worship the Lord tonight. And uh, actually, the portion of scripture that I have tonight is, uh, uh, is much to do about worshiping the Lord. And uh, um, uh, for some time uh, now, our, our pastor's evening services and sermons have been basically, uh, to the most part, to help, uh, ge- well, geared to the, uh, the young people in the church. Uh, and I kind of would like to continue that, speaking again uh, tonight to the young people. I know you've heard a lot of preaching, uh, but uh, I think we'll have something here for everybody as well tonight. Uh, and um, we trust that God has answered prayer, and uh, many of you young people have been challenged as you come back from camp, and hopefully we'll have opportunity to hear uh, testimonies in uh, the few weeks ahead. But um, I'm going to speak on the, uh, the topic tonight, uh, a return to reality. Uh, yet my uh, passage of scripture uh, is about a story that is beyond reality. It's, uh, uh, it defies reality, actually, and uh, it is nothing in the realm of real things, uh, it, It was real, but it wasn't, and uh, that's in Mark chapter 9. If you'll open up your Bibles tonight to Mark chapter 9. You know, I have never brought a message, an entire message on this tonight, but uh, uh, in fact, I had a different message, but uh, as I began reading, it was just like the Lord impressed me to bring uh, this message to you tonight, and um, uh, I would like to talk about the transfiguration of of Christ, and the impact that it had on the life of the three men uh, who experienced it, that being Peter, James, and John. So Mark chapter 9, verses 1 through 9, let us read it. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here, which shall not taste of death, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John, and leadeth them up into a high mountain to part by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his raiment became shining, exceedingly white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. And there appeared unto them Elias with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make uh, three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. For he wist not what to say, for they were so were afraid. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. And suddenly, when they had looked round about, they saw no man any more, save Jesus only with themselves. And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be here and to challenge uh, hearts tonight and to see uh, uh, what you'd have for us in this passage of Scripture. Uh, Lord, we, uh, uh, we see uh, God's light shining uh, through you uh, in this instance, uh, not upon you, but through you. And uh, uh, Lord, we just uh, uh, pause and want to take the time to worship you as you uh, deserve. And I pray that you'd speak to hearts tonight in uh, a wonderful way. And uh, uh, we, we trust on you and believe that uh, uh, you have something for us tonight. As we try uh, to return to reality, and we just pray that uh, you'd have us to be what you'd have us to be in this world of uh, darkness. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. One thing we know about this uh, passage of Scripture uh, is that uh, after our, our Lord's transfiguration, after this, uh, 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 it left a lasting impression 
uh, no doubt, upon the disciples. In fact, um, in Second Peter, in Second Peter chapter one, uh, actually Peter talks about this very thing. And of course, he couldn't say anything until after the Lord resurrected. Uh, that was very clearly given to them. But after Christ resurrected, in one of his letters to the churches, wow, Peter, Peter, uh, uh, he laid it out plain. Uh, first current, uh, Second Peter, first. Uh, chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. I want to read that to you as well. And, and here's where it says. It says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. Now that eyewitness of His majesty, uh, uh, most commentators are saying that that refers to when Christ was transfigured before Him. And uh, that, that's what he's referring to. And then uh, 2 Peter 1, 17 says this, For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. And, and here uh, we can understand that that had a lasting impression on one of his disciples. And uh, in the accounts of, uh, uh, of the Gospels, three of them very clearly uh, mention this. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, no doubt it left an, uh, an impression upon the rest of the disciples as well. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all uh, talk about this transfiguration. And, and they all put a uh, different light pardon the pun, a different light on the subject. Uh, uh, in fact, Matthew said that uh, uh, his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as the light. Uh, and uh, we have what Mark here says, that uh, his raiment was, became shining, exceedingly white as snow, uh, so as no fuller on earth can white them. I mean, it was like, it's beyond what a tailor or a seamstress could even possibly make. It was so white. It was, it was white, <laughs> uh, basically. And then, and then uh, uh, Luke adds to this uh, account that his raiment was white and glistering. And so they all have kind of a different account. But, uh, uh, and, and, and even though we, we can't say that John mentioned this in his writings, I actually believe he did. In, in, in a scripture verse in John chapter 1, verse 14, uh, you know the verse, and it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as uh, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And when he says, And we beheld His glory, what do you think he was talking about? I think he was talking about that time up in the mountain. The glory of the only, what, begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And I believe that verse there uh, could also be a reference to that uh, which took place before his very eyes. In Japanese, that uh, John 1.14, it says, Kotoba wa hito no natte, watashita chi no aida ni sumo arata, watashita chi wa kono kata no eiko o mita, chichi no mimoto kara korarata hitori go toshite no eiko dearu. Kono kata wa megumito makoto ni michite orarata. I like... I like to use this verse often. John 1.14 is beautiful. I like John. I like the book of John. One of my favorite books of the Bible is John. So I, uh, I often would uh, use John 1, uh, pretty much re uh, memorize John 1.14, but it's a beautiful, beautiful verse. But anyway, what I wanted to say this, that uh, they all heard on that day the words of the Father, which were, this is my beloved Son. Hear ye him. That's it. Uh, it was real. It was a real voice they heard. It was truly Jesus whose face shone as the sun. Those who uh, attended when the Lord was transfigured, I believe they would have loved to stay longer. Uh, maybe they would have liked to camp out on that mountain. Uh, and delay coming down. Uh, Peter wanted to put up three tabernacles or three tents. 
Uh, one for Moses, one for Elijah, one for Jesus. It was as if Peter uh, wanted to just stay there and camp there for a while and talk. Uh, we could go in Moses' tent and talk to him for a day or two, and then we can go into Elijah's tent and talk to him for a day or two, and then we can go into Jesus' tent and uh, talk to him for uh, a day or two. They just did, it was almost like, hey, let's just stay here. We'll build tents and we'll just stay here. We'll listen to what, man, I mean, it's been 1,400 years since Moses has been here. Uh, let's, hear, let's hear what he has to say. It's been 900 years since uh, Elijah was here. Let's go, let's go talk to these guys. And it says, let's build a tent for them. Uh, but uh, uh, so uh, uh, he was thinking, man, this would be a great time to catch up with, with what was going on with Moses and Elijah up in heaven. And, uh, and maybe we could hear more from the Heavenly Father. Who knows? But uh, I doubt that this is probably the way it went. <laughs> In fact, the Bible does tell us that Peter didn't know what to say, so he said, well, let's build three tents. <laughs> but anyway, he, uh, 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 he wanted uh, to build tents, and I believe he would, would have stuck around that mountain and, and had fellowship with Moses and Elijah and Jesus just as long as uh, uh, he could. But uh, sitting around in a tent on a mountain uh, wasn't <laughs> Jesus' thing. He had places to go. He had people to see. He had things to do. That was Jesus. And uh, so after that, they did come down. But, uh, uh, but the transfiguration was truly beyond belief and beyond reality uh, for the disciples. And they couldn't deny what they had seen, what they had heard, and what they had experienced. Then before they knew it, they were back down below off the, fountain, off the mountain. And once again, they had to face the realities and difficulties of each day. They had to face the Mondays uh, of life again. Um, there's a picture of a little kid pout, pouting with his head in his hand, you know. And uh, uh, with this sad look on the kid's face, uh, the caption on the picture reads, Monday, you mean they happen every week? <laughs> Yep, <laughs> Mondays. Sad to say, they happen every week, and uh, and I we truly hope, and, and and many of us have prayed for you, young people at camp. We truly, I prayed for you to have fun. Uh, we prayed for you uh, to get something at camp, and, and I hope you were on a high plateau during camp. I hope God spoke to your heart, and now that you're back, welcome back to reality. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to have to face your Monday tomorrow. Uh, it's not camp anymore. Uh, life is real. And this is a good time to realize that you're going to have to face Mondays again. You're going to have to face the, the difficulties of life. Well, the Lord came down the mountain with his three disciples. And immediately, what happens? They meet, number one, disputing scribes. Number two, a disheartened father. Number three, a demon-possessed boy. And number four, defeated disciples. And, and I'd like to take each one of these, but the disputing scribes it talks about in Mark chapter 9, verse 14, the scribes, uh, just, the, the scribes, you know, they just couldn't leave the disciples alone. <laughs> you know, they waited until Jesus was gone, and then they took their chance again. But in Mark 9, 14, it says, And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them. How many this year have either been on vacation or camp, or will go on vacation yet? Raise your hand. Okay, that's quite a few of you. What is the one thing we hate when we return home? We have to face the real world again. Uh, who would want just a few more days to prolong uh, the relaxation? Uh, who wants to come back to all the world's disputes again, right? Uh, one of the church men I was talking to just this week, I, uh, uh, um, I, I was talking to him and uh, he told me lately about a traffic jam somewhere close by, uh, and uh, I, I had to laugh just a little bit, and uh, 
I, I told him he probably didn't know what a traffic jam actually was. Uh, but uh, uh, until you have been to Japan during their national holiday, which is August 13th through the 15th, when traffic leaving Tokyo on the tollway could be bumper to bumper, well over 50 kilometers, and the return a few days later uh, would be the same in length, if not longer. And I'm sure sitting in those uh, lanes on the tollway, uh, they probably looked at each other in the car uh, and, uh, and uh, said, or asked, are we having fun yet? <laughs> I can imagine that conversation went going and coming. Are we having fun yet? Uh, but uh, uh, I have been in some of those traffic jams myself uh, uh, in those, one of those crowded expressways, and my wife can verify this. Uh, you know what I usually said on those expressways, sitting on those expressways? I usually said, well, uh, no faster than we are going, they should make this road free. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, I, I hated to pay a toll for, a, uh, for, for an expressway that uh, you couldn't move on. But um, anyway, my, my mother's here with us tonight. And uh, just recently, she shared uh, an experience she had when she came to visit us in Japan. Uh, a Costco store just opened up about 20 minutes away from us on the expressway. And, uh, and it was just opening up, so uh, we thought, well, this will be nice. Let's go, let's go to that Costco store. It's just 30 minutes away, so we got in the car and headed towards uh, the store before it opened, and, and, uh, uh, and before we could get off the uh, tollway, uh, the traffic began to back up, and it was quite unusual for it to be backed up so far, and, and we, uh, you know, bumper to bumper, finally got through the tollway, and, and we couldn't figure out why the traffic was, was so bad. Was there an accident? But anyway... By the time we got through that tollway, uh, we figured out what was going on. We weren't the only ones that wanted to go to Costco on its opening day. <laughs> it seemed like everybody else <laughs> within an hour wanted to go <laughs> to Costco on that opening day. And, and, we, and she shared that with me. And uh, I remember that. But uh, yeah, uh, so what did we do? We got off the tollway and headed home. <laughs> we didn't feel like sitting in two hours of traffic just to get a kilometer away uh, to the Costco store into the parking lot. And so uh, we didn't do that that day. But, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, the disciples when they, when they were um, uh, coming down off that, that mountain. Uh, you know, dealing with traffic is one thing, but I have found that dealing with people is quite another thing. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. And, uh, and, the, and uh, they came down from that mountain, and, and they had to deal with, those, uh, with the scribes and the Pharisees. Uh, and that's what Peter, James, and John faced when they got back down to reality. Uh, the scribes were picking a fight uh, with the disciples of Jesus again. We won't go all into that dispute, but it was a dispute. Uh, and uh, it was like the scribes were picking on the disciples, but the scribes didn't have any answers to, uh, uh, to, to the dilemma either. Uh, but uh, uh, as Christians, we don't want these fights, but they, but they just seem to find us, don't they? <laughs> uh, and... Uh, Disputing, it seems, has more and more become a part of our everyday American life. Number two, I'd like to talk about the disheartened father, verse 14 through 18. It talks about the disheartened father that we uh, read about. Uh, here was a man whose uh, only child was, was becoming more and more a burden to his way of life. And this was his reality from the child's early years. Verse 21 says, And he asked his father, how, uh, 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 Jesus asked his father, uh, How long uh, 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 ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. So here's a man whose only child had been such a bereavement to him 
for quite some time. The child was demon-possessed and was about to drive the father mad now, too. Uh, he was disheartened. His only place of possible solace was at the feet of Jesus. So off to the feet of Jesus he goes, only to find out Jesus wasn't there. The disciples were there, but they couldn't do anything. And the, and the disciples were helpless. They couldn't help him either. And, uh, and then Jesus came down. And, uh, and touches the boy and heals him. You know, we're all going to face disheartening times. We're all going to face uh, disappointments, uh, heartaches, defeats, uh, embarrassments. This is life. Welcome to reality. This is life. Uh, we don't like to come back down from the mountain to face all, all these daily realities of heartbreaks. Uh, we'll get hurt by our family, by our friends, and maybe other Christians. Heartaches around us are reality, folks. Uh, we all see that in true life. A man was so depressed of the pandemic one night as he thought about the economy, jobs, his savings, Social Security, will it be there uh, when he retires, retirement funds, wars, etc.? He called the suicide hotline. He got a call uh, center in Pakistan. And when they told him, and when he told them he was suicidal, they got all excited and asked if he could drive a truck. <laughs> yeah, a suicide truck. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, that was supposed to be funny. That wasn't a, that wasn't a true story. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, even... Uh, can't even get freed from st stress calling the, the, the hotline, the helpline. But anyway, um, number three, I'd like to talk about the demon-possessed boy. That's just in verses 17 and 18. Uh, you know, uh, the boy was very hard to deal with. This story uh, is a story of Satan controlling a child. Um, and, uh, you know, it, not, it may not be uh, as much a thing of history that we would like to think of Satan controlling, uh, but uh, Revelation 12, 12 says, The devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Uh, you know, the devil... Uh, a demon afflicted this child with an incapacity of speaking. Here is reality. Evil was with him. Evil is with us today. Satan's work, uh, to our chagrin, is too prevalent uh, among the people of this world. Uh, I know it is not what we want to admit, but uh, haven't, you be able to, haven't you been able to see that the work of Satan in these last days uh, is speeding up? Uh, I can see that, and it's no uh, doubt uh, clear in, in uh, uh, his mind, Satan's mind, that he only has a short time to work and destroy lives. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked who can know it. And boy, if we aren't in desperate times, I don't know uh, when we will be. These are desperate times, disheartening times. Uh, we'd love to spend our days under the shield of, a, of our powerful Lord on a mountaintop uh, uh, or, or camping out, unless there were flies and mosquitoes around, of course. We wouldn't like that too much. But uh, yet the evils of this world is calling us to come and help and help quickly. They need someone to look for help. And it won't come from uh, the pretentious religious crowd. Uh, we can't. Uh, uh, the, uh, the real condition of our existing evil world <clears throat> is calling out to us true believers for the answers. They're calling out to us uh, for help uh, in their times of distress. And, uh, uh, and we can't help this world and the spiritual wanting souls while we're on the mountaintop. We must be here. Uh, we must be here in reality, not only to see uh, the true reality of 
uh, our world and where it is headed, but also to see where we as Christians may be lacking and in need of help too. We would rather be away from it all, be at camp, be on the mountains, on a lake, anywhere but here, right? But our Lord would have us to be right here. Uh, our Lord would have us to be here shining uh, as lights to this lost world, as Brother Ron preached about on Sunday, or Wednesday. He would have us to be right here in the thick of things, uh, so to speak. Not a part of the wickedness but, uh, around us, not a part of the wickedness around us, but a solution to the wickedness around us. That's why we're here. That's what reality for the Christian is all about, is being here uh, for those who are truly seeking answers. Not here being like the world, but being a clear difference and being separated from it. The people seeking for answers. You know what? They hope that they can come to us to find help. People seeking for answers will come to us and they better be right when they come to you and me. And we'd better be prayed up and ready for when they do come to us. Uh, uh, you know, uh, this, this world that we live in, this world, this real world of sin that we live in, needs to know that sin is not an all-controlling force in everybody's life. And that God's people may know the answers to life's problems. And uh, at least we know if we don't have the answers, we know the one who does. We know the Lord Jesus Christ. He knows the answers. And, 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 and folks, let me tell you, Jesus is just as much here today as he was back in the days of uh, Peter, James, and John. He is much a part of our life today as he was in the part of the lives of the disciples back when. Uh, and so um, uh, we need to daily depend on his strength for the sake of, uh, of the lost and dying souls around us. You and I need to come down off the mountaintop, uh, wherever, it, may, wherever it, it had been, and be right here where uh, people around us uh, need us. And the fourth thing uh, I'd like to talk about is the defeated disciples. Uh, here was a situation uh, where the disciples found themselves and they looked totally helpless. They were helpless, totally helpless, uh, uh, probably a bit embarrassed. But it, it also made the Lord look, look bad uh, before the scribes as they were his representatives uh, here uh, on earth while he was away. Uh, and it no doubt bothered them that they couldn't do what Jesus uh, would have them to do, try as they may. In Mark chapter 9 and verse 16, uh, I will read, just read that again here. Mark chapter 9, verse 16, it says, And he asked the scribes, What question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out. And what was the next words? And they could not. The, the man's words ring out loud. They could not. In Japanese, dekimasen deshita. You want to try it? <laughs> dekimasen deshita. Or uh, a little less polite is dekinakata. Uh, dekinakata. They couldn't help. Uh, uh, but what our Lord wanted to hear is we can. Dekiru. Try it. Dekiru. Dekiru. Or dekista. Dekiru is we can. Or dekista, which means we did. Dekista. Uh, but uh, we can do better, folks. Uh, we can be better. We can shine brighter. That's why you went to camp. That's why you went on vacation. That's why you go. So you can uh, have time not only with your family, but also time in fellowship with the Lord. So we can come back and, uh, and shine brighter. We can come back and be better. Uh, this is the Lord's desire for us and in us 
and of us. This is the Lord's desire. And so, um, let, me, um, let me give you a takeaway. <laughs> I know the, I, the preacher likes to give takeaways here. But the takeaway from the sermon here tonight is this. Uh, do not let the daily, dastardly, demanding, deplorable things of this life bring us down. We're back to reality. Don't let any of it, don't let any of it bring us down. Point number one, always remember the Lord of glory. When the Father spoke of His Son Jesus, He spoke of Him from a cloud. And we believe that, that uh, He spoke to Him from the cloud uh, of God's Shekinah glory, which word does not appear in Scripture, but, tr but traditionally uh, it was where God met with men in the Old Testament. It, it's uh, uh, Shekinah, Shekinah means uh, uh, that which dwells or that which resides. Uh, and it's where God dwelt with men. It's in five places in Exodus. It's in Leviticus chap uh, chapter 16, verse 2, inside the holy place on the mercy seat. And then three times we find it in Numbers. We see the cloud in Numbers. Uh, we see it in First, Corinth, uh, First Kings chapter 8 and in Chronicles uh, uh, where uh, the dedication of the temple took place. Uh, we, we see reference of it in Psalms 80 and verse 1. Uh, they also saw it in Ezekiel. Uh, and then uh, when Jesus ascended up into glory on a cloud of, uh, on a cloud of glory, uh, uh, it was witnessed in Acts 1-9. I believe that cloud was the Shekinah glory uh, cloud. And the Bible tells us that he will one day return on that cloud of glory. Luke 21-27 says, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Remember the Lord of glory. Um, the Lord in the previous chapter of Mark had just taught the disciples that he was to suffer and he was to die and that he would resurrect from the dead. But remember, uh, Peter would not have nothing of the Lord's death. And in Mark 8, 31... Well, we're, we're right there. We'll just read that. Mark 8, 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed. And after three days rise again. And he spake that saying openly. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned about and looked on the disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou favorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. I think Peter spoke out of great love here uh, for the Savior. But he was unwittingly used of Satan. Uh, there are things that be of God that we may not like. Uh, uh, and that we don't understand. But we must face those things with courage. And, and we must carry our crosses. Whatever the trials or whatever the testings might be. And there are many things that be of God that we don't understand. Yet we have to accept them as God's will. Which is why we need to think upon the Lord of glory as our example. And look to the one who will see us through these times. Well, I'm about to close. Let me say this though. The disciples following their Messiah thought that the kingdom of God would soon be established on earth with power and great glory in their lifetime. They thought it was going to come in their lifetime. What a shock when they found out here it wasn't going to happen and, and that uh, their Lord was going to be put on the cross instead. You know what? That wasn't in their plans. That wasn't in their thinking. Oh, how our earthly tabernacle how our earthly minds are constantly in need of repair. Isn't that true? Uh, number one, remember the Lord of glory. Number two, remember your mountaintop experiences. This is for you, young people. The little things that God does for us, make them a big thing. The little things are the big things. Whatever God did for you at camp, don't forget it. Keep it in your heart. Your week at camp, your time with family, your vacation. Uh, but don't forget what God is doing 
in our church as well from week to week uh, and year to year. Don't forget the big or little things that God is doing for us amongst us in our church and through us. Don't forget those. How many of you have uh, lost something and you were looking for it without success? Then you prayed and asked God to help you find it. And before long, God answered that prayer and you found what you're looking for. How many have had that experience? <laughs> Most of us. <laughs> How many were trying to do something and you just couldn't get it done? And, and uh, try as you may, you couldn't get it done. And you prayed and you said, God, help me with this. <laughs> uh, I've been there. Uh, but how many of you have been there? You prayed and God answered that prayer. Uh, uh, Pastor Henry's car just broke down not too long. I had to, had to, had to have it fixed. And I, re- I remembered back to a time, I've got an old 97 Ford. And I was driving and the rear brake line uh, broke on me. And so uh, I had to replace the brake line. And, and uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's really rusty. And so uh, I, had, I was taking off the bleeder valves. And uh, on the two back bleeder valves, and both of them broke on me, trying to take them off. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, trying to get those bleeder valves in, and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, I did a lot of praying. <laughs> we, tried to tor- we tried the torch. I did, I did a lot of things trying to get it. But, you know, uh, I kept praying, Lord, help me with these stupid bleeder valves. Well, I got them off. I got them off, and then, and then I was trying to attach the, uh, the brake lines to those bleeder valves, and, and one of them, don't, wouldn't you know, it's one of them, it's the last one, right? The one of them would not go in. It kept leaking. It didn't, didn't matter what I did. And, and I prayed and prayed and prayed, and you know what? It got answered prayer. And those little things, when you pray and God answers prayer, you know, that's That's what I'm talking about right there. Don't forget, folks, the little things that God does for us and and give God the glory for for when he does answer our prayers. Um, Let's have a word of prayer. If you would, close your eyes and and bow your head and let's have a word of prayer. Uh, And I would like to ask all of you here to uh, remember how God, especially the young people, remember how God spoke to your heart during camp. Remember what God spoke to you about during camp. Remember what your decision was. You're down in reality and, oh yeah, it'll be easy to forget. Don't forget it. Don't forget it. God wants to do something through you and he spoke to you at camp and and he expects you to go through with whatever decision you made. And if you'll go through with it, it won't be a little thing. It'll be a big thing. And, you know, we, we will face reality, but we will also face it with God's pleasure and help if we continue to 